Hello, lovely humans, and welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, hi, my name is Jamie Wolfer, and I am a wedding planner who does weekly tips and tricks and advice to help you figure out how to plan this whole crazy wedding planning thing. Um, and I'm not sitting in my normal seat, uh, as you can tell, and this is not my normal setup because I have had the honor of flying on out to LA to do a very interesting collaboration. Now, a couple weeks ago, I made a reaction video, and I think the only other reaction video I've ever done was like reacting to the Netflix Say I Do series, and like, I cried in that one. Uh, so I really haven't ventured into this whole space. Uh, and let's just say that the reaction to the reaction video was a little bit unprecedented. So when the creator of the original video reached out and said, hey, I think it'd be great if we had a conversation, I went, oh my gosh, thank you. Yes, please, let's have a conversation because it didn't exactly leave the tone that I wanted to have, that I wanted to leave my audience with, her audience with. And so graciously, they offered to have me come out to LA to join Miss Chelsea from The Financial Diet. Hi, guys. <laughs> I know you're probably not my biggest fans, but if you go over to my channel, I apologize for some of my words on the wedding industry. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> but you know what? In your defense, like a lot of your perspective is a lot of the perspective of a lot of people. Right. I, mean, I, I would hazard to say that a lot of people would agree with a lot of what you said. Mm -hmm. And I would agree with quite a few things that you said. In fact, in my reaction video, I didn't give them much screen time, but I did say I agree with that point. I think I think we're just, we're looking at something that is very emotional, uh, especially when it's emotional and tied to large lumps of money. And um, we're making these financial decisions for the very first time. It can be really difficult for a lot of people. That's the whole premise of what I do on my channel. And I know that people's finances are something that you... I mean, that's kind of the premise of your whole channel is helping people out financially. Yes. Um, and it's unfortunate that a lot of you guys probably saw my channel through the prism of that wedding video because mm -hmm. overall, the theme of TFD is that it, the life that you want to live is really your business. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of financial content is very, very shamey about how people choose to spend or not spend their money. Um, and our general thesis is that money is a tool to help you live the life that is right for you, which no one else can tell you what that looks like. Um, and if you want to spend $500 a month on makeup um, or $0 a month on makeup, both of those choices are completely valid. Um, and it's all about finding the budget that will help you make those choices. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of education that you do on your your channel and a lot of empowerment, a lot of uh, how do we empower people to make wise financial decisions. And obviously, a wedding is a pretty big financial decision for yes. a lot of people. If you're going to have a wedding, it seems like you're automatically signing up to spend anywhere from five to $10,000, and that's on the low end of things. Right. And that's a serious savings chunk for a lot of people. Yes. And, yes. And I think it's often... Um, one of the things that I think uh, gets people in a lot of trouble about things like weddings, uh, home buying, even having children mm -hmm. is that we often don't look at these things as first and foremost financial decisions. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's important that we reframe in our mind that, yes, a wedding is about love. It's about commitment. It's about family. It's about celebration. But for most people, it is ultimately one of the most significant single financial choices that they will make in their lifetime as, as it comes to discretionary spending. And I think looking at it through that prism, a lot of people think, oh, that's so unromantic. That's so, yeah. you know, <laughs> it, it, I don't want to think about that. Um, but looking at it that way, I think, and especially looking at it that way far ahead of time, gives you a level of control that allows you to just enjoy the moment. Absolutely. I feel like a lot of people just avoid talking about or thinking about money and just like closing their eyes, crossing their fingers and hoping for the best. And so I oftentimes receive couples who are now in the throes of wedding planning going, holy smokes, this costs way more than I thought it would. But we do have a generous amount of viewers here who are not even engaged, not even, we call them single Pringles, not even seeing anybody right now. Um, and we have people who are in the process of planning their weddings and trying to figure out their finances because you're right. This is the single most expensive day that you may have in your entire life other than putting a down payment on a house. How many times in your life are you going to drop 30000 in one day? I mean, sure, you spend all that money over a certain amount of time. 30000 for most people, is considered on the low end of things. Yeah, and I think we also do need to recontextualize for ourselves on a party. And like, that's not a judgment. I I love great parties. I would spend, if I could afford to spend regularly $10,000 like on an annual party, <laughs> hell yeah, I would do that. That rules. But I do think that we need to not allow the 
cultural discourse and the individual pressure around mm-hmm. that day to let us lose sight of the fact that we're ultimately talking about an isolated event. Yeah. And for example, you know, a lot of people, something that we talk about a lot on the channel is prenuptial agreements. Mm-hmm. I personally believe that all couples should have one. You can check out content that we've done on the channel. But it's interesting to me that people will spend hundreds of hours thinking about all of these individual choices over the flowers, the food, the, you know, the, the dress, all of that stuff and not really give any time or space mm-hmm. to making financial decisions about your long-term marriage, the thing that comes after the wedding with your spouse. Yes. There's something that I – that was a very emphatic yes, but there's something that I've talked about before where it's you still have to pay for groceries right. the week after you get married. Um, and I've said this before and I, I don't know how well it was received necessarily, but I've said uh, this is not the single most best day of your life. Hopefully not. What nope. a sad like indictment of the rest of your life. Like you peaked at like 28 or whatever right. year you got married. Sad. It's a great day. It's a great party. It's a great opportunity to celebrate your love and your journey together. Like all the bachelor terms that we're throwing in, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, so it, it is that option. Yes, it is a wonderful day, but this is one day of your entire life. It may be the bookend, the start of the next chapter, but it's not going to be the single most best day of your life. So I think it's important to, one, challenge the wedding industry in that way because the uh, you said something in your video of you know this is the best day of your life and you should spend the money and there is that mentality with a lot of people in the wedding industry right i hate it i absolutely hate it i'm like no i would never tell you this is the best day of your life it could be one of them sure because yeah. you're surrounded by all your favorite people but that's not an excuse or a reason to spend so much money that frankly, you shouldn't be spending or couldn't afford to spend, but you're only doing it because of this moniker, because of this title of the best day of your life. Absolutely. I mean, you mentioned The Bachelor. Like literally just yesterday, um, we were interviewing a a former contestant on The Bachelor and talking about that whole experience. That's Mm. one of the most popular shows on television. Think about the messages that that conveys. You know, the the price of the rings that they're getting. You know, the pressure that's put on the event itself, the entire focus of it being on getting married. Like that is an a massively powerful cultural narrative that you're and other people in the wedding industry who are trying to do this a better way are fighting against. Yeah. And that's just one show. Yeah. And that's just one portion. That's one kernel. That's, and we're also going against historically what we've been looking at for decades. I think in 2008, we saw a shift from the fancy weddings to more DIY. That's when we saw burlap. We saw lace. We saw sunflowers and baby's breath because people were getting scrappy because financially a lot of people had taken a big hit. And we've seen that trend really grow in the last, oh gosh, 13 years. That feels weird to say out loud. What the hell? (laughs) I'm still using my mason jar (laughs) glasses at home. (laughs) The show call that that DIY wedding aesthetic has had on me personally. (laughs) So we've seen an amazing just surge of people getting scrappy. Yes. Of people really trying to make their finances work for them. Of Pinterest just booming, both in a good way and a terrible way. So it's opened the opportunity for people to spend less and still get the wedding that they want by DIYing, by using some elbow grease. Um, but it's also, Pinterest specifically, has created this, like something that you can call, like the Pinterest black hole is what I call it. Like you just, all of a sudden you start comparing. I, I think the industry is gone radical in two separate directions. Mm -hmm. One, we now see these beautiful styled shoots, these really expensive weddings. And two, we also see these really inexpensive things, these budget advice. And so I think it's, I think you're right. I think we are trying really hard to veer away from that traditional look and really push for what happened in 2008 to continue going so everyone can afford a wedding that they can afford. I totally agree. Obviously, when it comes to setting a budget for your wedding, most people think we're just going to toss a number out there and we're going to try to stick to it. Yeah. But what if we took a step back and said, how do we get our finances prepared for a wedding? Right. Because no one thinks like that necessarily. Very few people start a savings account for their wedding. Mm-hmm. So I personally think like step one to figuring out getting your getting financially ready for your wedding day is you got to become familiar with your own account. You have to know where your spending is going. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, it's really important. So if possible, I think – Depending on the type of wedding you would like to have, um, and only you know roughly the scale of what that would be, um, ideally you would be starting to save and financially plan for it several years in advance. Mm -hmm. And for many people, they may not even necessarily be engaged or or be with the person or be with anyone. Um, Most people, I don't know what the average, do you know what the average length of engagement is? 
Most people say 12 months, but it's all over the place. Okay. So let's say it's 12 months. Um, that is not enough time for most people to save up five figures or more of yeah. money. So I do think if you are the person who wants at least the option mm -hmm. of having a larger wedding, um, and you may choose to redirect that money elsewhere, but if that's something you know about yourself, you need to make that decision it, you may not yet be with someone, you may not yet be engaged to a person you're with, but you need to make that decision several years out mm -hmm. and start planning for that financially. The alternative for a lot of people, there's really two practical alternatives, is they will take money from other uh, people in their life. A lot mm -hmm. of times people are helped financially by people like family members. Um, and I'm sure that you would agree that like that can be an option, but that also does come with having to take their opinion on a yes. lot of things that you may not want to. Um, and the other alternative, which sadly does happen more often than we'd like to think, uh, is going into credit card debt yeah. uh, to pay for parts or all of your wedding. Um, so if you want to be able to do it financially in a very proactive and um, self-contained way, that's something you're going to want to plan for years in advance. And that's also something that you're going to want to do, as you mentioned, like in tandem with all of your other financial decisions. Like yeah. you said, like you have to buy groceries the next uh, day after you get married. So having that focus of not just thinking about the wedding you want, but actively weighing those wedding choices against other financial choices, because you really can't do it all at once. So for example, do you want a, you know, a, a large venue where you can receive 200 people and have them all, you know, covered for food and beverage? Or do you want to have a much smaller wedding and be able to like get a new car in a yeah. similar range of time? Things like that. So I think not just thinking about what you want in a vacuum, because in a vacuum, you probably want everything, but also thinking about it in comparison with other financial choices around that similar time scale that you'll be making. Yeah. My husband and I had this saying for so long, you know, if we decide to get Taco Bell or something, we're like, oh gosh, we probably shouldn't. Okay. Do we want Taco Bell or do we want a house? Yes. And it's the most ridiculous comparison. Obviously, buying Taco Bell and buying a house are two very different things. Right. But it was about reframing how we viewed our finances. And I think if you get on board with figuring out wedding finances early, perhaps even before you're engaged, you could be by yourself. But if you start to train yourself with good money habits of, I'm not going to buy Taco Bell. Instead, I'm going to put this into a different account to help cover a big cost one day. And that's the deal. It doesn't have to be for your wedding. But setting up good financial habits could really benefit you if you choose to have a large wedding. Totally. Yeah. And I think one of the biggest uh, financial uh, issues that people run into when it comes to wedding planning is that most people don't start proactively saving for their wedding years in advance. Mm -hmm. Most people don't even think about it until they're engaged. And then you're engaged and all of a sudden, all of these financial decisions are being presented to you. Um, all of these spending choices are, are being put in front of you. Um, and you feel the same pressure that you would feel to make these decisions that you would if you had that money, but now you're being faced with all of these choices to make and you don't have that money mm -hmm. saved up. Um, so that's when people, because it's very easy, again, in a vacuum when you're planning before you're even engaged to say like, I, I think I would like this or like that. Mm -hmm. But when you have your mother-in-law talking to you, when you have the event, the venue talking to you, it, it becomes much, much harder to have clarity around uh, your budget in those moments. Absolutely. And I think that's where people end up finding this channel is because they hit that panic and they're like, what do I do? Yes. Oh, oh, shoot. People have opinions. This is a lot of money. Oh my gosh. And a lot of people, easily three-fourths of people getting married, choose to not hire a wedding coordinator or a planner or cannot afford to have one. Mm -hmm. So they lack that guidance of how do we allot our finances? What do we do with this income? How do we make this happen? Um, and then there's the societal pressures, the family pressures, and the other vendors being like, oh yeah, this cost is going to be $5,000 and you just get this sticker shock. So I think being able to be aware of that earlier in the game is really helpful. And worst case scenario, again, if you don't spend that on your wedding, you still have money saved. Yes. And I, I would also say, and this is true for weddings, but this is true, I think, for all events generally. So at TFD, we're planning for a larger scale event later this year, an in-person event. Oh, thank God. <laughs> We've missed them so much. Um, and we were looking over the budget um, uh, a couple weeks ago as a team. And we basically, our, our uh, financial person who comes a little bit from the uh, events space herself from a financial perspective, went through a lot of the line items and she was like, kick it up, kick it up, kick it up. Like, mm. Because you don't know, uh, A, until you get there, how easy it is to spend more than you think you're going to spend on these things. But B, the worst feeling in planning an event 
is having an idea of what you want and then running out of money before you get those things. And that's when people feel under the gun. That's when they break out a credit card. That's when they borrow money. Um, So really not only planning for the event that you want, knowing what that costs, but giving yourself wiggle room in the budget, overestimating your cost, making sure that you're thinking about things like tipping out your service staff, making sure you're thinking of things like um, if one of your bridal party can't afford the dress that you want them to wear, do you have a budget to cover that so they don't have to give up being a bridesmaid? Like thinking of those costs that aren't necessarily on, you know, the bill that you might be handed, but are likely to become part of that event. Yeah. And that's one thing that we cover, at least in the budget on the master plan, is there's a 10% uh, miscellaneous fund. And that's for, um, I wasn't expecting this. Oops, there's an extra fee that was added on that I didn't see coming. Or the third option is my favorite. I thought I was going to DIY this, but now I don't want to. So I'm just going to go ahead and chuck money at it because I had big ambitious ideas in my head and now we're two weeks away and I'm going to cry. So just spend money on it, which is also why we allocate certain percentages to certain areas of your budget. Like X amount should be spent on your venue. That doesn't mean that you have to stick to that number exactly. But if you know that typically speaking, a venue is going to take up 19 to 20% of your budget. If you overspend in that area, it doesn't necessarily make another area cheaper. Right. So I think having that aw- awareness as well of uh, just because you want to splurge on one area doesn't make something else less expensive. You need to know that early on. Otherwise, you'll run into that exact situation where you're like, oh, shoot, <laughs> I don't have flowers. I want flowers. I'll just use your credit card. And then it just starts to snowball from there. Totally. And this is why we recommend something we call sinking funds. We don't, we didn't name that, but like it's called a sinking fund. Basically it's a savings fund that is for a specific goal. Mm -hmm. Um, We recommend A, that this savings account exists uh, at a different bank than whatever your checking account is because Mm -hmm. you do not want to be able to access that money easily. You don't want to be able to go to the ATM and transfer money over from it to your checking account. Um, We also recommend that you change the account number, whatever it's like 259, whatever, to the name of what it is. Um, And for something as large scale as a wedding with so many different components, I would actually recommend several sinking funds for either different components of that wedding Mm -hmm. that you can sort of rank by priority or different tiers of that wedding. Like you are able to save up this match and it will give you that wedding. And then you have a few spillover, like if you want to maybe save more for a slightly more luxe experience or to be able to do certain things. But for example, with a wedding, you can have one sinking fund that's just for the wedding itself Mm. and then maybe another sinking fund that's for the rehearsal dinner beforehand or that's for the bachelorette trip or that's for, you know, something you'd like to do for your bridal party. Um, But making sure that these are very dedicated and separate savings goals, that means separate from your emergency fund, separate from your retirement, all of that stuff. Um, And again, doing that early on, like if you are a person who knows you want a large wedding, you're ideally saving at least three, four years in advance. Yeah, which is, I know for so many people, sounds like goals. Right. Like, like, that sounds amazing. In fact, we had someone, we have a a podcast that's geared towards wedding professionals, and we had someone come on who works in the finance space, and she had $17,000 saved before she even met her husband. And I was like, girl, (laughs) give me some of that. How does that work? Now, for people who are already in the throes of wedding planning, who people, they're already writing checks, they're already making payments, what do you think your best advice would be for them? Perhaps they don't have a sinking fund, but they do have a set budget, whether that's from family members or friends contributing or from their own savings account. How do they uh, spend wisely, do you think? Um, Three things that I think are really important to do with any, and this is with any event or life choice, whatever, Um, but in the case of weddings, really note, I would even write down in your, like, wherever you're keeping these notes, write down at other weddings what you're like, we didn't need that. Yes. Like, I'm sorry, this is one of my pet. See, I'm doing it again. I can't (laughs) stop being so bitchy. But here's the thing. At a lot of weddings I've been to, at the dessert, there's the cake, which everyone eats. And then there's a dessert bar. I hate it. Which almost no one ever eats from. And I'm like, don't have the cake then. Yeah. Like, do you know what I'm saying? Like, I that's one thing that I think. And again, if you're like Willy Wonka and you want like all the desserts, like that's your place <laughs> to spend. But for me, that was a clear like we don't need it. We yeah. a cake is enough. Like, how many desserts do we need? So keep a running list of things that you experience at other weddings that you're like we could have done without that, mm-hmm. and really keep it with you. Refer to it when you're speaking with the venue, when you're speaking with vendors, so that you can really keep. Because I I'm obviously never I have a hard time speaking my mind, but I know that. For for a lot of people, when you have someone in front of you, you have the venue director or whatever, who's like, well, typically blah, 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 we, this is what we do. You're like, um, okay, you know, I, I, I guess, you know, and that's how people end up spending often on things that they yeah. otherwise wouldn't have independently done. 
want. So note what you don't want and keep it like it is sacred. You keep it next to your heart. Uh, number two is before you actually are making, you're putting your credit card down with your future spouse, go through and rank order. You have maybe four categories, mm -hmm. must have, you know, really want to have, nice to have, whatever. Do that. Um, and make sure that that's things that include, like you said, all the miscellaneous stuff. Yeah. Um, and again, these, these are all things that you would ideally have. They're not things that you can say we do without, but they have different levels of, we really want them. Yep. And then lastly, number three, and this one is like a little bit more about, so a lot of what I took issue with in my video was costs getting passed on to guests or bridal parties, which is a very big phenomenon and things, things that I think other people can't always necessarily advocate for themselves about when you have a when you're a bridesmaid you can't afford the dress but you know that you have to have you have to get it that's when people on their end break out the credit cards and that's what I don't like to see but also keep a tally of what is the budget of the other people mm. and i do think that's something that often gets ignored but should be factored into your spending yeah. decisions because if you're making a spending decision that maybe saves you money but passes cost on to all of the people you know, that you care about and don't want to be putting them out of their budget. Um, that's something that you might think twice about if you were also looking at their budget. Yeah. Well, let's return to the cake thing for a moment because <laughs> I have spoken about cake on multiple occasions. What's the cake take? Dude, so much cake gets tossed. Yeah. So much cake gets thrown away. I actually see dessert tables as a, a wiser investment. Yes. I say skip the cake and go for the dessert table because okay, it fits fair. more palates and more people will eat from it than a cake, but oh my gosh, <laughs> if I had a nickel for every time someone commented on one of my very first videos and they're like, I love cake. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm like, that's great, but your guests don't. And so it goes into the trash. So how do we make sure we're allocating those funds, those funds wisely? I mean, I've seen full on tears of it just tossed. Which makes me so sad as a cake stan. But I will say like to that point, like you would skip the cake and go for the dessert bar. I would do the reverse. But yeah. I think the, the idea here and this you can find in many examples, you don't need both. Right. Like you, you really can't have it all and nor should you again, even amongst the things that you do want. Yeah. And to speak about the priorities, I do agree. I think returning to that, I think writing them down, we suggest an exercise with your uh, spouse to be of sitting down with a piece of paper, writing down your top three things, the things that are most important to you. Um, we have a full breakdown in the master plan of actually called a speed test where you're supposed to go through and mark them one through five. So as you're saying the priority list stuff and I'm like, wait, that's actually what we did. Cool. So a financial guru like agrees <laughs> with what I made. That's perfect. That sounds great. Because, and when things get stressful, you return to that list. When things get difficult, you come back to that list and go, okay, does this fit? Right. Because one of the things we, we list out is guest experience. Because mm -hmm. a lot of people are like, I want my guests to have a great experience. Right. Which ties in with your third point. If you want your guests to have a great experience, how affordable are you making your event? Right. Is it a destination event? Is it requiring a bunch of people to come in from out of town? Um, if so, you know, maybe should you choose to have your event back in your hometown so less people have to travel mm -hmm. because it would make for a different guest experience? Or if they are going to travel, how do you make the experience fun and affordable? Right. Do you pick a location that people actually want to go to? Do you avoid holiday weekends because there can be so many right. extra charges that are associated with that? So once you figure out your priorities, it is important to continue to kind of come back to those. So even if you're already spending, even if you're like sinking fun, that's cute. Don't know her. We're already six months into this or 12 months. <laughs> Thanks, COVID. Uh, and we're kind of still figuring out how to do this. I think those three tips are going to be massively helpful. Well, thank you. And this is maybe controversial, but I would make it if I were you and you were already in the throes of spending a hard rule. Anything that would go on your credit card and can't be paid in full at the end of the month. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not talking about like a payment plan that you've already sort of arranged with, but yeah. any like we're talking flowers, we're talking, you know, um, auxiliary day of expenses, we're talking about bachelorette trips, those kinds of things. Anything you're putting on your credit card that can't be paid down in full at the end of the month, which by the way, I encourage all people to use credit cards in that way, which is very responsible responsible, accumulates points, accumulates miles. Hmm. It's just churning purchases through your credit card. We put as much as we could of our wedding on our credit card, but only to filter it through for the points. Yes. We didn't accrue a dollar of interest on that. Um, but if you're putting any purchase on your credit card that you cannot afford to pay in full at the end of the month, you should say no to that purchase because paying interest on those things is the worst thing you can possibly do. And I know that a lot of people do put um, their weddings on payment plans yeah. for the venue and things like that. And that's totally understandable, but that's a separate expense that you're making directly with the venue. And in that case, 
look at your interest terms. Look at the payment terms. Are they charging fees for yeah. your ability? Like you should be negotiating that as diligently as you would a car note or a mortgage or anything like that. Yeah. There's something we touched on uh, that we did as like a little bonus video through the master plan where it's called honeymoon hacking, where mm-hmm. you strategically use credit cards once you already have funds set aside in a separate account that you are not touching. It's not related to anything else. So much like the same idea as a sinking fund, but I, I didn't even, I didn't know what that was. I'm going to be this. <laughs> so But something that you don't touch and then you put something on a credit card, but you already immediately have the money to pay it off. This is going to be one of the single most expensive days of your life, but you also have a predictable budget if you stick to it and a predictable end date. So Mm -hmm. if you can leverage perhaps some travel cards and you already have that money sitting aside in a designated account, then you can get points. I mean, I, I know someone who got a trip completely for free by leveraging and hacking because they had a set aside budget. They knew there was an end date. You could have your honeymoon completely paid for. Oh, that's one of the best, best tips. So it is one of the rare expenses in your life where you have a large um, amount of fixed costs, most if not all of which can be churned through a credit card. And you have, like you said, a trip with an end date in mind. And you can do tons of travel hacking research to make sure you get the right card. You line mm-hmm. it up with the right dates, the right destination. If you're putting twenty five, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 of expenses on a credit card, which in many cases people are, like yeah. at minimum, the flight's probably probably part, if not all of the hotel, you could get on points and miles if you do it with the right credit cards. Especially if you're strategic, from what I understand about when you open the card, because it's within the first three months, you get X amount of points or this this amount of rewards. So I think having that financial planning is, I mean, y'all, you could get a free honeymoon out of this. Yes. You just have to become familiar with your finances and be comfortable making financial decisions. We are not blindly waving around a debit card a credit card, crossing our fingers and hoping for the best. This is an expensive day and we're taking ownership of where that money is going. 100%. Now, speaking of taking ownership, sometimes when we get uh, outside opinions brought in for an event, which is all the time, uh, oftentimes those opinions can come attached with financial gifts towards the big day, which then means that your mom, your aunt, your grandmother, your mother-in-law all of a sudden now feel as though they have permission to make commentary or give their very strong opinions or subtle opinions that they feel like you should do. I think this is one of the singular most expensive days where other people's opinions are given space. It's almost like, you know, if your parents gave you $5,000 towards a car and they're like, but you can only buy a white one. You don't hear that as much. Right. I mean, I'm sure you do in some families. I'm sure some (laughs) families are like white car families. How was my family growing up? We were a white car family. Interesting. My parents did not have like the (laughs) car cleaning discipline to be a white car family. (laughs) But this is going to be an experience where opinions are attached to money that are attached to emotions. So in your expert advice, how do people handle that? Okay. So I really wish that I could like Little Mermaid style give all of you watching an amulet with like my ability to be like absolutely (laughs) not to people Um, because that is a skill like anything else. That is an absolute skill. I think for a lot of people when it comes to setting financial boundaries with others, it's very helpful to have scripts. It's very helpful Mm. to role play like with your spouse. Like you know you're going to have a conversation with a family member who's going to have opinions that you need to set boundaries around you know, knowing what you're going to say in advance. Um, Sometimes it's easier for people. You might at the very beginning of planning send an email so that you can, you know, be really thoughtful in how you sort of set the initial stage Mm -hmm. and your boundaries. But the truth is, um, if you want to resist against that pressure, and you have every right to, it's important that you get comfortable with saying to someone in so many words, I totally respect your choice. I think that would be beautiful. but for us, we're, we're going to do it this way on this thing because that's what makes most sense for us. And I really hope that, you know, we can still make it something so enjoyable for both of us. I think for the most part, when it comes to family, now, again, there are some true like monsters in law out there who are like just out to like <laughs> usurp your, your wedding day and make yeah. it, you know, their thing. But I think for most people, what they really care most about is feeling included, feeling loved, feeling like part of the experience. So finding a lot of ways to make those important people feel seen and validated is very important, but you ultimately do have to get comfortable with saying, with having your full, clear, unapologetic no. That all being said, and that is important in finances and in life, when you take money from people, you do give up a certain amount of that power, control, and leverage. This is true in all financial transactions between people. It is a fraught thing to take money from people in most cases. 
some people can lend money between one another or give money between one another and have a great relationship to it on both sides. But that's not super common. Often yeah. there's that power differential. There's that inherent tension that's created between the parties. Um, it can Then the person can have very strong opinions about how the recipient is spending that money. Mm -hmm. um, and you say, and it's true that like it's not as common to give a gift and then expect such clear terms. But for example, a lot of people will lend someone money and then be very, very, uh, have a lot of opinions about how that person is spending their oh, money yeah. as they take the loan. I do think it's important to be very lucid about the fact that although it is so normalized in our culture to take five or ten thousand dollars from a family member, you are still receiving a financial gift from someone who is likely to have all of the maybe not so great relationships mm -hmm. around that loan or that gift. Um, that is common through all financial transactions yeah. in our society. So taking that money, and this is something you said in the video on our channel, taking that money to some extent is going to come with a trade-off and a price. And it's not always easy to totally quantify that, but to use an example, taking $5,000 from your in-laws is going to necessitate adding 30 people to the guest list that you yeah. might otherwise not want, which yes. can probably, will probably balloon into costs that far exceed their investment and will also maybe have some negative impacts on your experience of the day, your ability to manage it, et cetera. Yeah. Making a very clear cost-benefit analysis between the money that you're taking and the kind of wedding that you're going to be having as a result of taking that money is crucial because when you're talking about money between people, even family members, sometimes especially family members, that complicates things and that removes a lot of your power and leverage to have that no. Yeah. Yes. Because the expectations come attached. The opinions come attached. The guest list comes yes. attached. And we see that often where even even if the parents aren't paying, because most of the people we deal with are actually covering their own. Occasionally, there'll be some gifts from family members um, or some account that dad's been saving for his little girl's day for so long. But we see that less and less, especially with the, the budget that I tend to work with the most. We don't see as many gifts of that nature necessarily. But the guest list thing really gets me because... Mm. So many times parents will be like, well, you have to invite this person. They were at your christening. And you're like, mom, I haven't seen them in 25 years. Like this is not, that's not how this works. So I think to your point of, you know, you have to have a script ready. You should practice having these conversations, especially if it's not your gift. Cause I know it's not mine. I don't, right. I, I used to not love having financial conversations. I didn't have a great relationship with finances because I didn't have any. So I was right. like, I just never looked. So I think getting comfortable with having these conversations and then assigning a cost to a guest is very important. We had, I did one video, I forget the title of it, where it was like the actual, or the number one thing that's killing your wedding budget. Mm. And that's your guest list. Mm. And I calculated out the average cost. Just average speaking is about $100 per person. So my challenge in that video, and I'll re-challenge it here because it's, it bears repeating, would you take that person out to dinner and spend $100 on their meal? Are they that important to you that you would get that bougie and take them to a really fancy meal? And if not, why are they coming? Because you are spending $100 for their tushy to be in that chair, at that table, with that centerpiece. So how do we make sure that you are making healthy financial decisions and putting up healthy boundaries when recognizing that if a parent wants to add 10 people to the guest list, that's $1,000 on average. It could be cheaper. I know a lot of y'all are scrappy and you're probably not going to be spending that much. But on average, we are watching that cost just go higher and higher and higher. So at the end of the day, it does matter. You have to figure out what your priorities are. We discussed this on your channel, which by the way, jump on over and check that out. That went live yesterday. We discussed the long-term effects of some of these decisions. What matters more, wearing the black dress or having a good relationship with your mother-in-law for the next 40 years? You need to make that decision for yourself. We can sit here waxing poetic all day long, but you're going to have to make that choice for yourself. So you need to assign a cost to decisions. You need to not stick your head in the sand about it. And you need to be frank about these decisions with those people around you, whether they're donating toward your wedding or not. I totally agree. And I think, you know, ultimately, I think what's missing in a lot of the wedding conversations that we have on all sides, but I think especially coming from the couple, um, are setting very clear um, parameters mm -hmm. from the get-go with all parties that give them lots of outs. 
because I do think that that is often what is missing. This is very common in things like bridal parties and things like the guests who maybe can't afford to travel to to be with you or can't afford to give a gift or whatever it might be. Um, But it's also very missing, I think, often with the families in Mm, terms of, you know, my husband and I, we paid for the vast majority of our wedding and we did that intentionally because we wanted to do it the way we wanted to do it. We did ultimately take an equal amount from each of our families to pay for specific auxiliary events. Um, But we're very clear with them from the get-go of, you know, if you want to give us this gift, we're so happy to take it. Mm -hmm. Um, We're not going to change the guest list. We're not going to change the location, things like that. So they still obviously um, generously gifted us that money. And we're both, you know, obviously happy with the outcome of how the, you know, the, the week turned out and everything. But it was a huge relief going into even accepting that money, Mm -hmm. knowing that they were very clear on what the money did and didn't mean. Um, And I think similarly for all of the other people who are involved in that day, having those very frank conversations up front about not only, you know, this is what I'm asking of you, but this is also how I can help you. These are the boundaries up front, you know, uh, or, or, you know, for people, as I mentioned earlier, who may not necessarily be able to afford everything that you're asking of them to attend or be part of your wedding, making sure that you have a frank conversation with them up front of like, Let me know if any of this is an issue. We've got ways we can work around it, et cetera. Um, I think having those conversations up front in the very beginning stages um, helps set the terms because we can want to avoid to have those frank financial conversations or set those boundaries because it can feel unpleasant. And we can sometimes think, oh, it might dampen the magic of the moment. Yeah. But it's exactly that lack of clarity that creates people feeling conflicted, feeling pressured, um, feeling resentful, um, or feeling like they have to succumb to one another's pressure, whether it's your pressure of accommodating your mother-in-law or your bridesmaid's pressure of accommodating the expensive dress you want her to buy, but she can't really afford. Like we need to relieve that unspoken pressure on all sides by setting clear boundaries up front. And I mean, you're absolutely right. And this is not the first time you're going to have these conversations in your life. Hell no, it ain't. (laughs) It's like, this is just the beginning of so many financial conversations you're going to have with your partner, really and truly, because you're going to make big financial decisions moving forward. Think of planning a wedding as your first crash course and like organizing your finances collectively. Absolutely. And I, as a last note on the couple thing, so as I mentioned, I do feel strongly that most, if not all couples should have some kind of a prenup and should have all kinds of very intimate financial conversations Mm -hmm. before even even considering getting married. Um, And if you want to know why, again, channel. But I also think one dynamic that I've personally seen in a lot of people I know who've gotten married, and I'm sure you might have seen, is a woman who's very involved in the planning, in the decision-making, who has a lot of thoughts on these things, and the man who's generally pretty uninvolved, pretty uninterested. Is that something you've seen? Generally speaking, when it yes, when we have a, a man and woman getting married, the responsibility typically falls on the bride. The bride is right. the one that makes all of the decisions. The bride's the one that has to pick the. I mean, sometimes the brood, the groom will have an opinion and select a type of food, or occasionally be like, "No, I don't really like that color." But traditionally speaking, and still alive and kicking today, it is the woman uh, making those decisions. That I think is a pretty remarkable example and a distilled example of the uneven division of labor that often happens in domestic spaces in Mm -hmm. heterosexual couples. You know, women take on the majority of the domestic labor at home, even when they also work full-time jobs. Women are often most involved in these sort of life planning moments, things like buying a home, from a lot of the logistical or domestic perspective, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Many couples generally function quite well that way when, you know, the man and women simply handle different things. But it's important to remember that that doesn't exist in a vacuum and that shouldn't just be the way things are because they're the way things have Mm. been. There should be an active conversation if you're taking on the majority of these planning responsibilities, which is a lot of work on top of probably the job you have and a lot of other things you have going on, that that's an active conversation. Hey, I'm taking on all of these tasks that are really demanding to make sure our wedding's a success. What are you taking on? So we're making sure that we're splitting that evenly. And if your spouse's response is like, I don't really care about this. So I don't really want to be putting time into this. This is your thing. That could be a question of maybe we need to scale back what is what we're doing together. Maybe we're the kind of couple who should elope, like all of those things. I don't like situations when I see the woman assuming the majority of the responsibility and labor in an unthinking way. Yeah. You don't have to plan a big wedding just because society has told you or your mom has told you that you have to plan a big wedding. We do get that a lot of how do I 
get my fiance more involved. He's just not into the details. And I'm like, <sighs> he probably shouldn't be if he doesn't want to be. But that has to be a proactive choice because right. I do think we end up often living out financially and in terms of partition of labor and responsibilities, what we model early. Mm. If you are early on demonstrating that you're okay with just taking on all these responsibilities yeah. and not making it an active conversation, that will be expected in future um, situations like that. So I think it's important to have that proactive conversation. Yeah, because again, this is the first time you will be having major financial decisions in your relationship together. Most likely some may have purchased a home already, but this is still another very big decision. So setting the tone for how you want your marriage to go, for what you want your relationship to look like, especially from a financial perspective, if you can set that tone firmly with kindness, with grace, but being honest, it could affect how you handle your finances for the rest of your marriage. So I think starting on the right foot, starting with the right tone, sometimes it can feel like ripping off that band-aid, but having those conversations, getting it out into the open, and being honest about it is going to bode far better than just crossing your fingers, closing your eyes, and wishing for the best. Totally. As a last anecdote on that, I was once at a wedding where the groom said, and I quote, she really put her whole heart and soul into this. I just showed up and I'm like, oh my oh God. My God. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you say that out loud? But it's a phenomenon that we need to address. Yeah, absolutely. And and to also take and turn inward and say, if I am obsessing over this event and I'm the only partner in our partnership that's doing that do I keep doing this? Do I keep going? Um, and that's why you elope. That's why we try to come up with a myriad of different options. But I think you need to ask that question for yourselves. And I think it'll go really, really well if you're honest about it. I agree. So that's what we have for this week's video, guys. Thank you so much for watching. I am like still kind of in awe. Yeah. You're, you're like super famous in my oh opinion. My God, stop. So stop it. <laughs> so thank you so much for reaching out, for saying something. I am so excited that we had this conversation. I think you bring so much value to the table. Oh, thank you. And let me be the first to say, actually, we technically already aired your video, so you were the first to say, mm -hmm. but I apologize for the tone within which things were carried out and got us to a point that was like, oh, that didn't, that didn't sit right. And I apologize for my tone, which was a little bit more judgy and acerbic than I'm normally going for. But again, please do refer to my video because I do uh, address some of the things you guys yeah. took issue with and I issue some apologies. So yeah, all in all, this has been a very successful collaboration. So if you did enjoy this, please be sure to check out the financial diet. We of course will leave them linked right here and down below um, because there's tons of financial wisdom that is coming out each and every single week. Also subscribe. <laughs> also subscribe to this channel for uh, more tips and tricks for the modern day bride and until next week bye guys bye